Hello, everybody. everybody. Um, welcome again to another event of this, uh, of this uh, conference. Today, it's called Collaboration Art Contro Confronts Apathy. And uh, the idea is to discuss with five uh, artists or people who have been engaged uh, with the arts how these subjects of uh, collaboration or engagement with the community or uh, with specific groups uh, nurture their own works and, and then how does that impact the, the community again. And I think it's going to be very interesting because we have five artists from quite different fields, so we should have uh, various perspectives. I just want to give a very brief introduction and then uh, let, the, let the discussion begin. I think that th this is one of the, of the subjects that comes up more frequently when dealing with art, is uh, uh, the subject of collaboration or engagement, or should art be engaged, or, or should it be like um, just uh, an aesthetic experience uh, out of its own? And I think that the two, there are like two uh, extremes of the discussion. On one, on the one side, you will find a perspective that thinks that art should be engaged, should be compromised, should be highly political. And on the other side, you would find the posture of art for art's sake that has nothing to do with, uh, with the community or, or uh, with society. But I think that the problem generally with this discussion is that it seems that if art doesn't change or doesn't save the world, then it doesn't uh, like, like there is no middle ground. It either say, is there to save the world or it's only there as an aesthetic experience. And I think that this is not the case. And I think that the, the works that all these, uh, our five panelists have done uh, variously reflect the fact that there is a sort of middle ground in which, as I was saying, the art itself or, or the artistic expression can, can be made in a collaborative or engaged way with the community, and then in turn that changes or affects, I'm not saying the whole community or much less the whole planet, but it does affect uh, the individuals who get to, to work in the, in, the, um, in the work of art. And, and, and not only that, I think that something that is a bit unquestionable is that whether one thinks that art is there to save the world or not, I think that more, um, everybody would more or less agree that one of the crucial points of art is to challenge the point of view of the spectators, of the, of the observers. It's some, sometimes art is there to, to question values or to question established opinions. And I think that in that sense, uh, the engagement or the collaboration with the community or with specific groups uh, is a very clear um, example of this in which, uh, because the artist is never like, all there by himself in an ivory tower. He's always there with the community. Many times the work of art comes from experiences with the, with the community. So I think that, that those are um, subjects that are interesting to, to discuss with our panelists today. And I just, like, I just want to, to make a brief introduction of uh, a part of the work of each of them that I think uh, is a good example of the, of the subject of, um, of today's uh, panel. So starting first with uh, William Sterling, I wanted to point out his um, his work, Queens of Syria, which is uh, an adaptation of uh, a play by Euripides, the Trojan Women, but with a, with a cast of, um, of Syrian refugees that recount their stories and uh, like, uh, give a new voice to, to this classic play through the horror that is going on right now in, uh, in Syria. And then in the case of, of Marta, she's a, a theater act. She's been in theater. She's an actress and director. but. Uh, She's done performances in botanical gardens, hospitals, and she has included members of the public like migrants, homeless people, orphans, and uh, child prostitutes. Then in the case of uh, Valeria to my left, I think that her last two projects or her last two books have, uh, have had this uh, collaborative um, aspect. First, the novel, uh, The Story of My Teeth, came as a collaboration with a very important art exhibition in Mexico called the Humex Exhibition. And now she's, work, she's written an essay and working on a novel also on her, like related to her experience as a translator for, um, in, the, in the federal court in New York for, um, for child migrants. Then Asha, well, not only is translating like, obviously a collaborative um, artist, uh, artistic expression, but also she has worked with, with Open <coughs> Space, which is an NGO that promotes awareness on subjects such, such as globalization, and she also has, runs a, um, a residence for artists, for writers, for translators. And then uh, uh, Anna, to the far left, uh, 
She has a project called Turbolila in which they also engage, for example, they have an initiative called Social Picnic in which they organize somewhat spontaneously uh, picnics in the open space, inviting uh, people in need or homeless people to, to share in the, in the experience, but not just like in an assistential way of giving them food, but uh, rather like a communion, uh, like a communion experience, or, and, and they've also worked like very extensively in sustainable design. So, um, as you can see, I think that all five of our panelists have, uh, in their different artistic expressions, engaged or collaborated with the with the community. So, I wanted to to open the discussion by by asking all of you uh, what you think about this uh, general subject and how you think uh, your art or your particular expressions are, um, yeah. Uh, a collaboration with the community, and then how does the, the community, how, how has the reaction been with the public or with the people that you have gotten to work? I don't know if you would like to begin in a specific order or um, who wants to go first. Okay. okay. Um, yes, the, uh, the idea of this sort of collaboration, I don't believe any art is really only just for art's sake. I think it's always been designed for someone to have a look at and react to in some way, even the most bland of countries, you know, landscape watercolors. Um, but uh, this idea of, of the collaboration uh, with um, uh, the, the viewer as such, and also the, the protagonists, um, is a very interesting one. When we did our Trojan Women play, Omar Abbasada was the director we selected, and uh, we had a discussion about how we were going to find our cast um, and what we were going to do with them in a practical sense, uh, whether we were going to pay them or not. Omar was very against paying people. He said it was sort of, for this sort of thing, it, was a, it, it sometimes attracted the wrong people doing it for the wrong reasons. Not the wrong people, but people doing it for the wrong reasons. Uh, in the end, we had a compromise. So I said, we can't expect refugees who are paid absolutely nothing to uh, make their own way at their own expense to uh, the rehearsal room, so we actually did pay them a travel and, and food allowance, um, but which wasn't very much, but it was quite a lot in terms of, of, of what they uh, received from the UNHCR. Um, and again, with the uh, original project that we did in Nairobi, um, they were actually paid and fed, and uh, they were people who lived in very poor circumstances in the slums. But they wanted to do this for other reasons, obviously. And they wanted uh, their voice to be heard. And it, that's a very important. And, and they did so at some risk. Um, obviously, some of the women had <coughs> relatives who were still in Damascus. Um, some of them had <coughs> relatives who were being held by the regime, particularly um, one of our ladies whose son was being held by the regime. And so she made the very difficult decision not to go on the stage, although she'd become, in many ways, a leader of the group amongst this now self-created um, self group of women. They, uh, and she felt she had to leave. Unfortunately, it didn't save her son, who died uh, and was tortured to death. Um, but there are all sorts of reasons people have to want to engage with this sort of project. Um, and they uh, benefited from, and knew they benefit from the uh, therapeutic side, but also benefited from um, being involved with uh, a very superior work of art, um, and which was thanks to both their collaboration, but also to the vision of Omar Abusana and uh, his son, uh, Sam al-Sharif. It takes all of these people to make this thing. And the better it can be, the more people will want to see it. And that's the important side. People must want to see this. And we have discovered with the Queens of Syria project, the Trojan Women, that people want to see it. And um, it, you know, we've always tried to recreate this with all the other projects we've done, is that, is that um, is that we create something above and beyond as much as possible the sum of the, uh, of, of the, 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 the constituent parts. And that's worked so far. Um, and these women um, 
you know, are as involved with that as with the vision. It's their story, it's their telling. It's not just um, the words of Euripides, but their stories. And they tell them at risk to themselves. And so it is a very conscious act of witness, not necessarily defiance, but of witness. And um, this is goes to the heart of the collaboration, of our sense of co collaboration with, um, uh, with refugees in this project. Uh, yeah. Hi. Yeah, you, you, you touched a, a few things, but I, I would like to just add a thing to it. In Hungary, I think we have the problem is Anna Lengyel as well, who make documentary theater in Hungary. I mean, the question in Hungary, if you want to make any kind of project with, with uh, non-professionals, even with, prof prof with professionals, you need money. Sorry to bring up this subject, but that's how it works. And, and you actually, you mentioned yeah, yeah. the money yeah, as well. Yeah. And in Hungary, if you need money for such a project, then it's somewhere between the art and the social worker. Huh? So if you ask money from the government for art, then they say, yeah, but this is something social stuff. And if you ask money from the social part of the, of the government, then they say, yeah, this is art. So it's very difficult to find the, the situation or to find the money to start to work. But let's say we have money, we can start to work. And then there is another thing, what you just mentioned, and you told me that I, w I just worked, I finished a very big project now when I work with ch uh, child prostitutes. I mean, child who, who, who has to deal with such a things. And then the, <coughs> the question comes up about the responsibility. So it's not just what's going to happen with them or what, what happened with them in the, in the past, but what, what about their future? So you use them actually sometimes on the stage because they have some very touchy and very important experience. But the question how to do that, because they people, they're going to stay at, 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 like non-professionals. So they have to lead their life after, after all. And if you use these materials, what you know it's perfect on the stage or it's perfect like an art, it's gorgeous and you know everyone's going to cry or they want to change their life or whatever, you cannot do that eh, because of them. And for me, or I think this is a very important question, how can you deal with these things? Yeah, you are, prof you are a professional artist, let's say, and you know how, to, how is the best to do, but you just cannot do that sometimes. And quite a lot of time you, mm. cannot, do, you cannot use these task, these um, uh, materials and stories what they have. So, yeah. I think that's all for now. Yeah, that, I mean, just picking up about um, what happens afterwards. When we did Oliver, um, the boy who actually played Oliver was uh, his father, really didn't want him to do it um, for various reasons. And he said, I don't want my son to be an actor. And uh, we said, Let, it's not about being an actor. It's not about we're introducing, trying to introduce him to a career on the stage or singing or whatever. But, it's about knowing that you can do something that you've never done before and uh, helping to build your confidence. So I don't think any of these people are necessarily going to become actors. They're kids. Some of them might do it a bit. There's not much opportunity for acting in Amman anyway. Yeah. Um, but uh, the confidence you get from having done something very hard, and when I say very hard, they worked extremely hard to be able to sing in a way which made them look, although they were not in any way professional singers, had never, they could hold a note, but they had to, in the end, they looked like they'd been to some stage school since the age of four. Um, they worked extremely hard, and they recognized the value of hard work to get something which you hadn't done before, because, you know, this is a very important lesson. You're, you're a refugee. You're at the bottom of the pile. No one's going to help you. You're the bottom of everyone's priorities. There is so much you have to do yourself um, and uh, to try and make this new life to try and exist as a refugee where you don't know where you're going to end up, where you don't know when you're going to go home, when you don't know all of these things, or in many cases not allowed to work. Um, so in the end, we hope that, although we have always involved 
our, um, the people who have been involved in our plays with other stuff that we've done, whether it's a soap opera or, or, or Oliver was an extension of that. You can do, do as much as you like, but what one hopes one is doing is to create uh, or give back some of the self-confidence or create the self-confidence to say, you are actually, you can do this. Yeah, and you can do it in other fields as well. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's, it's this, this, is, this, is, the, this is clear. Yeah. But sometimes I have the experience that the responsibility for sure is still yours. Yeah, sure. And uh, because they don't know what does it mean if mm. they share it. Mm. So the, the, the way to, to end to any kind of product, it's for it's definitely great anytime. What, whatever you do is just good for them, I'm almost sure. Mm. I mean, art, I cannot image that the art ruin anybody. No. I mean, if there is something has to be ruined down. <laughs> yes, yes. And, uh, but still, you know what's going to happen. And mm. you know what is the, the, the conclusion of or all of these mm. things. Mm. And this, this weight is quite heavy, I think. Okay, so I can tell only about my field, which is uh, mainly design. In design, from since the 70s already, it's not a very strange term to collaborate and have collaborative uh, uh, projects. But uh, it's um, also a delicate topic there, since we have to be very careful what is the goal of this collaboration? Are we uh, just want to give back dignity? Or we want to raise awareness? What is this product doing in a wider sense? And um, what kind of values we are integrating? There are two different kind of mainly bigger group um, collaboration like that. And the merge of those, in the first case, we are working with uh, the involved people, like in your case. In the, in the second case, we are working with, with, with interdisciplinary experts together. And in the third case, we are merging all these things. And we, we look for people who, who can bring in knowledge also at the same time, as psychologically as uh, as, as um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the actual profession. So when I talk about uh, this kind of project, a very good example is what we did for the Vienna Design Week. It was called Guide the Diver. It was about how design can help dumpster divers to find what they want because Dumpster divers live on this stuff, and the whole population, if they would get the right uh, guidance, they would place out their rubbish in a way where it could be found in a much better way. In this way, the dignity could be given back. Dignity, very important word. And because sometimes dignity is enough to start a new life. Sometimes it's enough to to get from one to two, as we say it in Hungarian. Um, it's, um, it was a project where we interviewed and worked together with, with uh, more than 10 homeless people. And mainly what gave back their dignity was that they were looked as an expert in a topic where they never been seen, never been recognized as an expert they had a very different approach then to the whole topic. They gave us insights what nobody was able to give, how to design stuff, how to design a waste management system which is able to, to, to answer on a social level as well, and not only an environmental level. So, uh, it was a very interesting project. We came up with a lot of, uh, lot of ideas, a lot of uh, um, products, which, is, which became art because it was more a critical design. And as we know, critical design is more like, uh, more like art. So it's not really 
making prototypes in the end and not really, it's just uh, experimenting. So uh, I find it very important to see and to, to, to differentiate between the goals, how we collaborate, what we want to reach, uh, on what levels, how long, and, uh, and also um, how far you reach out with that. So as you said, you can change the lives, but what kind of right you have to, how far you can reach out with that. Um, uh, I'm a translator, but I work in a dead language, and I work with a text that was put together two and a half thousand years ago, and the author probably didn't exist, so I can't think of my <laughs> <laughs> translation work really as, as collaboration, so I'm going to speak um, not, as, um, not as a writer or a practitioner, but I'm going to speak uh, as an activist and an organizer. Um, and as uh, Eduardo mentioned, I run a writer's residency in India, and we bring, uh, you know, we raise money every year, and we bring writers from various parts of the world together with Indian writers, Indian writers who write in English, and more importantly, Indian writers who write in languages other than English. Anyway, so that's another story, which I'll talk about another time. But I find that <clears throat> uh, by running a residency, uh, what has become very clear to me is that collaboration is not simply about working together to create work, but it's also about working together to create a space uh, for work. Uh, not simply your own work, but the, uh, but the work of other people. And I think actually that this conference is very much about that. It has created a space for uh, practitioners from different um, artistic fields and from different parts of the world to share um, their experiences and their knowledge and you know hopefully I mean some of this will actually lead to collaborations in how we go back and think about the situation in our own countries and I think most of us here come from countries that at this moment are very fraught are going through very difficult times. And so the spaces that we create, safe spaces, um, become very, very important. Um, so Sangam House, which is a residency that I run, a Sangam means coming together, going together, actually. So it's very often a word used for the confluence of rivers. Um, but Sangam House is located outside a southern city in India, the city of Bangalore. And so most immediately, the community that we must interact with is the community of local writers, uh, writers who live and work in Bangalore. So we do that each year. <clears throat> we have a literary weekend in the city, and we insist on calling it a weekend, because now in India there is an epidemic of festivals, of literary festivals, you know. There's 75 literary festivals in India, not even in the subcontinent, yeah, so that's like that's three a month. Um, and festival now means that you must get like marquee writers, and you know, in the evening there must be singing and dancing, and there must be like you know, a writer's tent where somebody is sponsoring the alcohol and, you know, I mean, it's great fun to go to, but I don't know how much it actually creates in terms of a literary community that supports each other, supports work, um, supports the right to free expression. Um, so we do that. Um, and we try also through our work and through the writers that we get to participate in a pan-Indian literary community because we work in many languages. I mean, we try and get writers from, from many languages. We try very much in our, in our public face um, to reflect the tensions uh, and of course the successes as well of what's happening in Indian languages that are not English. Of course we think Indi uh, English is an Indian language, and it is. You know, there's more English speakers in, <laughs> in India than, you know, in many other so-called English-speaking countries, native English-speaking countries. Um, so it also becomes very important, I think, in, <clears throat> in countries like India, which are post-colonial, uh, where the dominant language, uh, the, the language of the elite, the language of aspiration, the language of, 
of when mobility is English, how do we relate to other languages? Yeah, how do we create a balance of languages where, you know, a metropolitan elite Western educated person like myself is not setting an agenda, but is actually listening to what other agendas might be. Um, uh, so uh, one of the things we tried to do at Sangam House was to set up collaborations with other literary festivals in, in India. You know, saying we're not a festival, we only do a weekend. Uh, so, you know, we sort of said that we have no stake in this because we're not going for the big sponsors and I'm not, you know, applying to like, you know, Alitalia to have Elena Ferrante, you know, come with a mask to, um, you know, to my festival and so keep her secret. But, you know, uh, we're not applying to big hotel chains to give us hospitality of executive suites and all that. Amazing. Not a single literary festival wanted to collaborate with us. We were like, listen, if you're bringing a writer, um, share. Share the writer. Let the writer go to the next festival. Use Sangam House as a place where they can come and stay between festivals. No, no, no. This is my writer. Yeah? So if I bought Elena Ferrante, nobody else in India can have Elena Ferrante. You know? Like, okay. And this, I think, I think um, the reason for this um, uh, uh, hostility, not hostility, this um, um, disinclination to collaborate actually is money. Right? And because those festivals are commercial, they need to tell their sponsors, nobody else will get Ferrante, only you will have her, right? So if we work in a more cooperative zone rather than in a more commercial, competitive, neo-capitalist zone, I think we have a chance of, of collaborating uh, rather than being competitive. Um, there's another community I think that's becoming very important um, another kind of community that's becoming important in India, which is a community, a literary community or an artistic community that rallies around a politics, you know, that I will not participate in a festival uh, whose stated politics is the religious right. I will not participate in a festival where I know that the organizers uh, favor censorship. Uh, you know, I mean, and these are like I questions, I think, as well as we questions. Uh, and then, of course, the other, the other thing that has uh, recently engaged Indian writers just last month in May, the big Jaipur Literary Festival does a little sort of show and tell in London at South Bank, and they took money from a mining corporation called Vedanta, which is a criminal mining corporation uh, all over the world, not just in India. Um, so a lot of writers, uh, uh, I was not invited, I should say that. Um, so we all wrote to our friends who were invited and said, you know, think about this. Um, do you want to, do you want to help uh, a criminal corporation whitewash itself by supporting the arts? And um, interestingly, all the people that I know, all my friends who were invited there as writers said they were going to go because they want to, in that space, sponsored by Vedanta, be critical of Vedanta. Yeah, and that's, that's a different kind of politics. There's a politics of boycott, which has one kind of effect, and there's a politics of participation, speaking truth to power, which is another kind of um, very important politics. So, <clears throat> um, just again, I, 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 uh, I think perhaps because uh, my own work is so sort of completely inside my head, you know, I, what am I going to check my translation with? It's not like, hey, what do you, how do you translate this word? They're all dead. Um, so I think, I think because I work in such isolation, for me, community and uh, collaborative community work has become very, very important. And I do see it um, as, as, a, as a, critical, uh, a critical way to engage uh, politically uh, in, a, in a globalized world. Um, I, I should just say that I, I met Asha when I was 16, 16 years old because she was my high school teacher in India. <laughs> and um, I haven't seen her ever since. And so now I, I, it was a surprise. We met each other in the lobby of the hotel. And it was a great surprise. Um, at first I was scared, like I thought I was going to get a grade on this panel or something. <laughs> uh, but no, but, but what I did want to say about this is is that uh, I remember you, Aisha, even back then in, in the early 2000s, in the year 2000, um, had created in your house, in this, in this crazy school where we all lived, 
which was like a, it's just a school up in a mountain, completely isolated from reality, um, had created very much a, like a, a communitarian sense of, 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 um, of being in that space. I remember that a lot of students would always gather around Arsha's house to just talk or read things to each other or so, so even back then there was already like a, um, this sort of sense of, 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 of creating a space for work was probably already boiling. Um, <clears throat> I like uh, the idea as well that collaboration is, is, not, is a way of not setting an agenda, not starting from setting an agenda. Um, I kind of hate the, the assistentialist attitude that some um, artists have when, when they engage in collaboration with a community. I don't expect to to save anyone or return. I don't, I don't aspire to return. I, I I'm definitely don't think that what you were saying, Anna, was existentialist or anything like that. But, but from where I come from and in writing, it's very difficult to even feel that you can do something that really even returns um, anything to people. It, it, uh, as, as a writer, there's always a lot of suspicion that you, what you do is worth anything um, to, to, to many communities, right? Um, I think at most I, I aspire to having a kind of conversation. And I think you were asking, Anna, that um, you posed a very important question about the goal of collaboration. And um, that's something I think that uh, we often forget, uh, that collaboration has become a kind of just uh, form, a, a genre almost, and, and, and you, you can forget uh, why you are doing it and why, why you engage with the community, why. Um, and I, I was thinking about, I was asking myself while you were, you were saying it, and I, I think that in, in my experience with collaboration, uh, the collaboration has been a kind of end in itself um, as sort of, it's, it's kind of like the opposite of art engagé. <laughs> it's like collaboration for collaboration in itself. I mean, and I, and I say that because the collaboration is, is finally, it's after all a way of laboring, going jointly with someone, right? Um, and you cannot have, I believe, a fixed agenda or idea before you begin the collaboration because then there will be no conversation. Then it will just be uh, the, um, the creator of the idea imposing an agenda or, or kind of bringing in uh, an idea for others to, to do something with. So I, I think that, that, that one should enter in collaboration with, with a kind of, uh, I, I mean, a feeling of being a bit lost, a, a very um, productive way of being lost. So I, I don't want to go on and on in a theoretical rant um, on collaboration. Uh, but I thought. Can I, can I just add something? Uh, yeah, of course, of course. Uh, like you said, it's, it, it can it can be, it can make a wrong way if you have any plan or any idea before and you just any get any plan that is too fixed or too but completely lost. I mean, sometimes you really go to that kind of people who are completely lost. But so by are the we, situation right? yeah. of, of their normal life. In a different way. So, uh, for example, when I work with homeless people, or I work with migrant people, or even with this child, who, the children who I was talking about, I mean, for me to go into there without a plan, what I just can drop away if I feel like, mm. for me, it's, it's, uh, yeah, for me it's impossible. Because I'm, I'm there, and if they, they don't have some, sometimes any idea of, of themselves as, as they are, who are they, and why are they, and what, what, can, be, what can happen. Mm. So just drop something on the table, it can start something. But we can, you, can, you can go to different uh, directions, and you can end a completely different uh, 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 way as yeah. you were thinking before. But to go somewhere without anything, mm. oh yeah, there are different ways. For me, it's completely impossible. I always have a, any kind of plan to go there and I say, what do I want to do because I'm an artist. So I, I have a plan. I want to do something with you because I would like to talk to, to the people. Mm -hmm. So for me to work non with, with non-professionals, there are two very uh, important things. At first, the work with them, like how they can develop themselves, how they can be, how they can be 
more than before, if you know what I mean. This is one goal of the work with them. And the, the, the second one, because you're gonna, you will have a, a premiere, let's say, which is more for the other people, yeah. not for them, actually. And you have to find a way how to work these things. So it has to be a little bit form, and it has to be a kind I, of... I agree. I, don't, I, I wasn't at all saying that you have to go in without knowing absolutely anything about what you're going to do. I just think that... Um, uh, in my very specific case, I, I like to go into collaboration uh, w without having, uh, and I'm a writer, so I, it's, it maybe yes, it's, a, it's a, a different field, uh, without having a prefixed idea of what I'm going to write and how the interaction in writing is going to be. So anyway, I was saying that I didn't want to go off in a long rant, and that I would rather show you maybe a little piece of, of a, a collaboration that I did. I don't know if this is the right moment, or you want to wait until the next round, yeah? Um, so I was told that uh, to wait until there was a cloud. Uh, <laughs> and there's been several clouds, but um, I can't really predict the weather. So I'm going to just, tr I mean, yeah, show you as much as, as possible. Um. Okay, so I'm, I'm only going to play like, um, like two minutes maximum, maybe like a minute of this, and once you hear it, I suspect that, that your Spanish is not fantastic, right? No? <laughs> Yours is? Okay. Uh, it doesn't really matter um, at all that you're, if you don't speak any Spanish. Um, I'm just going to play like a minute of this, and if, 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 if at all, the only thing that I would be interested in you hearing is kind of like the different voices and, and the general atmosphere um, of the room, and then, then I'll explain what was going on. because if you don't understand, it's probably just uh, a bit repetitive. Um, so so the, the, the woman that was, that was reading, um, uh, did, I guess you could tell that she was reading, right? It was quite clear. Um, the woman that, that was reading is uh, one of the factory workers of a big, big factory in Mexico called the Humex factory. The Humex factory produces juice. Um, in Mexico, we have this kind of Soviet way of naming certain uh, uh, national monuments of pride. So, like petrol, Mexican petroleum is pe Pemex, Petróleos Mexicanos, or Jugos is Jugos Mexicanos. Anyway, um, so a year and a half or so ago, maybe two years, I don't know, um, I was contacted by some people that work for a collection of contemporary art called the Humex Collection. Um, and the Humex Collection is a big 
a very big collection of contemporary art, very, um, they have a lot of money and have collected through the years a lot of, um, so to speak, important pieces of contemporary art. But the strange thing is that they are funded, they get their revenues from this factory. So it, it I mean, already that seems kind of like fiction, right? Um, or it, at least it seemed to me kind of like fiction that ha, ha, this, this big contemporary art collection uh, that really just buys art from, from the juice that they make. Um, and so when they contacted me, they wanted me to, to write uh, a kind of blog or something that, that registered the process by which they put together an exhibition. And I said, no, I don't do blogs at all. Um, I had Tamagotchis when I was young, and they all died. And so I, don't, I cannot do blogs. They give me a kind of vertigo. Uh, but if you want me to register the procedure by which you put this together, I can think of a way to do it. And I thought about it, and I remembered reading a really interesting essay about um, tobacco readers in Cuba. Is this something that you're familiar with, maybe? Tobacco readers? No, yes? So tobacco readers in Cuba were people in factories in the 19th century, um, but this has gone on to the 20th century, that would read out loud to people while they rolled, people in a factory, in tobacco factories, were, so they would read out loud to people while people rolled tobacco. Um, and it was a kind of paternalistic idea about sort of educating uh, our laborers while they produce, but it also did turn out to be a, a means by which people, I don't know, a means by which labor became, I guess, less tedious. Although sometimes the things that would be read out loud were things like the, the story of the Spanish crown. Uh, so that was always, I guess, a, a downer. But then, but then things came, um, um, then, th then they started getting more sophisticated with this idea and then people would read like crime and punishment and things like that. They still do this now in the 20th century, but apparently now the books that are being read in, in the tobacco factories are things like Fifty Shades of Grey and so on, which is really depressing, right? Um, anyway, so I had read an article about that and found it very interesting, so I thought, well, I would like to do something that involves reading with the factory workers whose work ultimately funds uh, the art that this big collection buys. So <clears throat> it was impossible uh, to, to do a, a reading while people were working in the factory, basically because there's huge machines uh, making noise. And the, I guess if I had read it, would have been this like Orwellian horrible thing in which like a voice would have come into the factory while the machines produced the juice. And that was just really uncanny. So um, the idea, uh, that we came up with was that I would simply send installments of something, something, I didn't know what, what it was going to be, and the, the workers would, would come together, the, whoever wanted to, and read that out loud and comment it and criticize it. Um, and so that's what happened. A group of 12 workers decided to join this project, and they would come together every Wednesday and read out loud. So what you heard was just one of the workers reading from, from what I had sent. And um, <clears throat> they were always like in this complete uh, kind of uh, classroom mode where everyone was laughing at everyone. And like people would read and sometimes they would make fun. Then they would start criticizing what I had said uh, on the writing. Uh, then they would always like comment or say like, well, this could get better if this happened. And it was a really, it was like a really playful um, sessions always that I would not li be there to witness. I would just get sent an MP3 file with with this, and then I would hear that MP3 file. And based on what they had said, and I guess based especially on the stories what that they told during that session, I would then write the next chapbook. So it was like a very 19th century way of writing a novel in a way, in this kind of installment, sort of Dickensian installments of very episodic um, short pieces that um, um, 
that would then sort of find a continuity the next week. It was like Dickinson with MP3 or something like that. Um, so yeah, I, I can't show you the pictures, obviously. <laughs> the pictures I, I wanted to show you were just some pictures that, that either people in the factory sent me or, um, <clears throat> or that people working, like young interns working for the gallery sent me in order to put the whole thing together. But there's just no way uh, <laughs> we can see them. So if a cloud passes, I might show you later. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, <clears throat> there's uh, many, many subjects and uh, it's a big table. So I wanted to propose like two general questions. I guess the first one would be more directed a bit to Anna, uh, Marta, and, and William as it deals with um, the specific case of working with a clearly marginalized groups, as would be the, the refugees or the homeless or the, or the child prostitutes. And, and, and I think it comes from, from some of the things that you've all been mentioning uh, regarding to, to the dignity, the awareness, or, or whether you need to have a plan. So the question would be for, for the three of you, but obviously if Arsha and Valeria want, want to say something, obviously you're more than welcome as well. But the other one, the other one is more for you. But so this one would be like if, if there is a, I mean obviously there is a difference in, in if, if you're doing design or, or theater or film, if you're doing like a, in a regular uh, way or if you're working with with these specific groups of uh, marginalized people. But, but the question would be if, uh, even though there is a, a special character, if there is like a complete difference in the way you approach it, or even though uh, it has this, uh, this specific nature of working with these people, can you have some professional exigence? I mean, can you, can you reproduce to some extent how you would go about it uh, in a regular way, or uh, is it completely different? And I'm thinking about something that I think all of you have mentioned, that uh, collaboration or engagement cannot be a charitable act, no? So I was thinking whether can you avoid uh, this, this trap of falling into a charitable life by trying to work as if you were going about your uh, everyday business, even though it's clear that you are not? Um, yes, well, uh, and this goes back to what Valeria and, and Arsha were saying, that there are some forms which aren't uh, instinctively collaborative, but um, theatre and film is, and in fact it's nothing else. It is completely collaborative. You, even if you write the script, you know it's going to be changed in 15 seconds flat. Um, it's, it, it, it is in no way um, did uh, we feel um, that we were approaching this charitably um, because we felt that what in, 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 in all the cases of what we did um, that uh, well with the exception of Oliver because uh, for various reasons we couldn't uh, change the music of Oliver, but the lyrics were trod beautifully and the whole play was beautifully translated into Arabic. Um, that was very much, um, according to Hoyle, perhaps, uh, uh, play. With the um, original the Nairobi mini soap series and with also the Trojan women, the input of uh, the participants was as important as the input from the professionals in that we would not have had what we were looking for if um, if our volunteer you know if our cast hadn't were, hadn't also written uh, large chunks of the uh, of the play uh, of the film script as well so <coughs> It's very difficult to say that. It, it, it's not the feeling. Um, it, wasn't, it didn't feel like that. Uh, you know, we were doing something for people and they should be grateful and all that. I very much felt that they were giving us something as well. And this was an honest collaboration. Um, just as the same as if they had said, I want to make a, a collaborative film about commuters going into the city of London. Um, I would not in any way feel or did not feel that um, uh, our cast was being treated in any, other, any different way from any other person would have been. Um, there were various reasons they wanted to be part of this play. Some of them to, um, to have a, a platform, a stage to speak about their experiences. 
And some of them uh, dragged the more depressed female members of their family there saying, you have to do this. We can't have you sitting around our home anymore. <laughs> you kind of come in and you're going to speak at that district. And I think this is going to help you. So they proactively realized as well that this was good or this had a therapeutic uh, um, angle to it. Um, and certainly with the... Um, uh, the kids in the slum, I say kids, they were between 18 and 28, um, they enjoyed making the thing. It was theirs as well. I mean, I couldn't write what had to be written. They had to write it. Um, but you have to, but people do want to form. If you, if you say you're going to go and do something, they expect something from back from you, which is form and structure. Um, particularly to do with film, it's technological, uh, also to do with theatre, it's technological, you have to be able to speak properly, you have to be able to move properly, and that's for the director to do. Omar Abu Sada um, made the women work quite hard for this, and they really did have to work hard, they had to do serious exercises. They're actually, for the, for the tour in London, they're now at the moment rehearsing there during Ramadan, that's hard. They've got to speak for three hours or so, and they're not allowed to drink water or anything. So. You know, this is an active, you know, they feel as the much the, the ownership of it as anyone else. But that they want is in the same way that I would want if I went to do something of which I wanted to speak or whatever. I would want to have some structure there. I would want to have someone to have a plan within it or a framework within which uh, I felt I could collaborate with them. If I felt that they weren't doing it in the right way, they might complain about it or decide not to do it. Um, it, to me, it's, it's, it is a two-way street, and uh, we get as much from it as they do. And, and I think that everyone has to be treated in the same way as though they were a professional or someone who needed to uh, have, have some framework, but also we wanted their input as well. Um, and, I, you know, consequently, you know, with the Nairobi film, they worked, didn't just input with the script, they um, worked extremely hard to get scenes right. Uh, some of them actually became crew as well, because we only really didn't have a crew. Um, I was a director, because someone forgot to hire a director. Uh, we had a very good cameraman, we had a first assistant director, and a third man, but we needed continuity, you know, all sorts of things, and they, and they joined in. But they regarded it as a collaborative effort. This is their, their product as much as anyone else's, and you know, that's how they felt about it. Yeah, when, when, I, when, I, when I go in any kind of people, let's say, who has one common problem, because that's what I'm interested in, then I have a plan, any kind of plan, and, at, and I always share it at the right first moment. So I say why I'm here, what would I do, and if you don't want to do, we don't have to do that. We can do something else, but then react, then say something. Most of the time they don't react fully, but they say, yeah, I don't know, we'll see. And this is very important, like they anytime can leave the project, mm -hmm. eh? and this, the risk is yours. Yeah. So that's something yeah. what you had to deal with. I mean, you have a premiere in two months or in a year, and you work with people, and they just leave. It's, it, yeah, it's something that you can, you have, to, you have to be aware of that for the whole period. I mean, this is very heavy when you work, when you go there every week, one or two or three of, of, of times of the week, and after 10 months, they say, oh yeah, I move, and uh, yeah. Mm. It doesn't happen so often, but it can be. And for me, if I work people, like non-professionals, I always, uh, the, the most important thing for me, just to keep them as they are. So I don't really train them, or I don't really, of course, they have to practice and they have to do things, well, for, of speaking course. Speaking movement, yeah. yeah. Yeah, sure, this is something. But I mean, actually, they cannot make a mistake, because mm. I have to be aware of that. Like, if there is any problem on the stage, they have to solve it, because they can make a lot of mistakes. Mm. And these things, the, the, the structure has to be like, it has to be keep going on somehow. And for example, the, 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 it's maybe a stupid example, but I, I like that very much. When I worked with homeless people, and that was also like two years uh, long project, then just one week of the, of the premiere, one of the guy, he said, yeah, I wanna smoke during the performance. <laughs> and, uh, and I told him, no, it's actually it was open air, so it, 
it could happen, but I said, no, you're not allowed to smoke during this one and a half hour, sorry. And there was everybody was sitting in the room, and he was one of the main person of the group, and he said, okay, then I leave. <laughs> and then I said, you know what? You live on the street, yeah, you don't know me so much, I mean, we know each other for a year, and I think this is something wonderful what you did until now, I think this is amazing, and I'm going to be very, very sad if you leave the room, but now you have to go out of the, of, of the, of the door, yes, go. If you are, if you are not partner, I mean, I yeah. take, I take your things. I know we have a, a, a Caesar dish contract. contract, and if you out of the contract, then you have to go. And if I out of the contract, what we have, I have to go too. And this is clear. And it, actually, it works always. Um, can I, yeah, can I talk even Sorry. though? Can I talk even though you said maybe Arshi and me couldn't talk? No, yeah, yeah, you can. I <laughs> no, it's just that I, I find it, it, it's also, I guess, it's really interesting to compare um, what our own disciplines uh, create in terms of um, structures of hierarchy and how that plays into collaboration too. So, I mean, in a film, if there's a director and a director is a really important figure to, to bring everything together and, and there has to be some clarity about, I guess, the plan and what you're giving as a director and what you expect as one director. Uh, and in the same as, as you are saying in, 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 in this in this project that you're talking about, in which also you plant yourself immediately in front of people and say, "This is my plan, and this is who I am," um, and it's it's completely different in 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 the sphere of of writing, right? Um, there's I, I, for example, did did not even show up physically, um, and the the workers never saw my face until the book was launched in Mexico and two of them came to the book launch, like a year later. Um, and I wrote under a pen name, so they didn't know who I was. Um, and I wrote under a pen name because I, full of prejudice, assumed that if I was writing for a factory, I was going to be writing for only men, right? And, and as you well heard in the, in, the pe in the little piece that I played, uh, most of the voices were voices of, of women, actually. Uh, not, because, not because the Humex is a place where mostly women work, but just because the, the, the women workers decided that they wanted to collaborate in this project. Um, I didn't, and the contrary, as, as, as what you're saying, I didn't set out um, by saying, oh, there's a cloud. <laughs> I didn't, okay, shit, do you have Eric room? <laughs> Sorry, that we have to um, use the cloud. I didn't start off by saying, this is my plan and this is what we're going to do. I just sent an installment and uh, waited for their reaction. And based on the reaction, I was able to write the next installment. The, and the collaboration really needed that space of, of me not imposing a previous plan, because otherwise it wouldn't have been a, a conversation, I think. Um, anyway. Now I've created these great expectations about these really shitty fl uh, uh, oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, next cloud, next cloud. Can we love this time until the cloud is back? Go, go ahead. Would you like to come? Go ahead. And there was just, uh, I think I definitely think it always gives you back to collaborate, to collaborate with people. Yeah, and you could collaborate for collaboration as well. There's no problem with it. But, and also the thing is that you can't standardize those processes at all. Mm -hmm. There are guidelines, facilitation modes, there are models, mm -hmm. there are even ideal cards produced and kits and tons of books on how to do that. But still, you're always doing it very unique, each and every session or each and every project. Now, the, in this particular project, which I mentioned for you, is, 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 is special because uh, we didn't work with these involved people as a group. So I went one by one to these people and I talked to them. But still, in the end, it was a collaborative 
critical design thing in the end. Because we had a, a group of designers, we had a group of homeless people who were first asked one by one. And when I asked them first one by one, then they said to me, oh, get off, it's really just, just design, what's that? You can't do anything for us. You can't figure out anything. What do you think? I, I just go, just, just leave me, give, give me a hundred for it. This, this, will be, this will be better. I don't, I don't want to answer your questions. I don't, then I say, can I walk with you for a while? It's just, just to see what you do, how you do, what, can I see what you search for, what, what you will take out from the rubbish bin? So step by step we became friends, a little bit, but up to the level only to be, to be expertise mm. on something. <coughs> so it was nothing personal and, and that's why it could work very well. What's the, what's the level where we give back? Is it an individual level or is it a social level or is it a subcultural level where we give back something? Different, very different. And you always have to look what is, uh, what is what you do exactly. So uh, to convince these people that it's it, uh, somehow, <coughs> I know you, you will not like what I say, worse to collaborate in a way. So, because there is always a kind of, uh, are you okay? <coughs> okay? So there is always a kind, of, a kind of contract, even when it's invisible. So I believe uh, the contracts are not always written. Well, I wanted to ask one, one last question <clears throat> that maybe relates more, or at least from my experience, to the field of, uh, of letters or, or books, but also the other three members, please feel free to, to comment. Uh, when you were talking, Arsha, and I don't know if it was the, the same feeling that uh, Valeria got, but what you were describing was very familiar to the Mexican or even the Spanish language uh, literary scene, and this thing with the with the festivals that rather than collaborating, compete, and I want the exclusivity of, of this writer, and also, uh, for example, what you were saying that sometimes the sponsor are, to put it mildly in the case of Mexico, a bit questionable. And, and I, th I, I think you said something very interesting when you said that neo-capitalism gets reproduced, and it's funny because many of the, of the writers that attend these festivals have like this big anti-capitalist discourse, or even the festivals themselves, like they see themselves as progressive or, or left wing or whatever, but I think that you hit a, a crucial point when you, when you said that we are, or, or at least some of these people are reproducing these, um, these things that they criticize. So I was thinking that something that we haven't talked about, and, and I think it's also important, is collaboration between artists, you know, because, uh, for example, in, in Mexico, in the Spanish language, there is like a lot of quarreling between uh, festivals, between writers. For example, Valeria, and, uh, who has been like very, very successful over the last few years, has really been a target for some people that simply cannot stand her success, and it's strange because we talk about promoting Mexican literature, and then we have a Mexican writer that is making it like in the world stage, and instead of people being happy, people are angry and uh, people try to, I don't know, say things. So I don't know if you would uh, both like to comment on this, because I think it's very important. Like, what is the, the collaboration between the, the, the artists or the writers? Um, first I'll say the positive part, and then I'll say the negative part. Um, absolutely, uh, I, uh, we have to, uh, this is the thing, you know, uh, in the 21st century, nobody uses the word solidarity anymore. You know, when I use it in a classroom, I have to explain solidarity. And it's a word that we grew up with. You know, it's an attitude that we understood that whoever we are, we, um, we join hands to strengthen each other and, of course, to strengthen ourselves. So uh, one of the very unique things about Sangam House, which is certainly something uh, unplanned, and every time it happens, I just sort of you know, really, I catch my breath. Writers who've been at Sangam House will fund Sangam House. You know, uh, small amounts of money they'll send and they say, this changed my life, it should change somebody else's life. So I think that's a fantastic example of artists supporting other artists. Um, where it gets nasty is, uh, uh, for, uh, you know, freedom of expression is really, really under very, very serious threat in India. Um, and uh, one of the targets of the sort of uh, 
mad people is uh, is books. Um, and so writers are, are um, under threat. So of course, what I mean, the obvious thing to do is to start something like uh, PEN, like PEN International. No, that so somebody, there's an advocacy organization, somebody speaks for us. If, so, if a writer is threatened or in danger, the writer doesn't feel alone. Uh, there are many of us who can rally around and help. I won't mention the city because I'm sure everybody here has a friend in that city uh, in India. Um, they wanted to start a PEN organization, three years. They haven't even had an election, yeah? Because this one's ego is too big, that one's ego is too small. Who is going to be the president? Who is going to be the German? Oh, guess what? We have no regional language writers. It's like, you started this? <coughs> Just thinking only English writers are going to be there? So it's like, wow, man, this is, uh, you can't even get a pen organization together because you're so busy, like snapping at each other's heels, you know? Um, and it always reminds me, there's a, there's a very sort of evocative, um, phrase in India, you know, we talk about ourselves as like ants in a water bottle, you know, they keep pushing each other down. Um, and, and that, that is, and I do think actually, I, I, I do think that we're in the situation of, you know, people being envious of Valeria's success or, you know, this city in India not being able to get a pen organization together. It's simply because we have forgotten words like solidarity. We've forgotten the meaning of community. And if we get those not simply the vocabulary, but the emotional vocabulary of these back into circulation, I think we, we have a chance of, you know, um, remedying the situation. We have, in, in Mexico, we have a saying, um, this, uh, uh, not ants in a water bottle, but, but crabs in a bucket. Uh, so it's exactly, exactly the same. Um, Especially in a post-communist country, to, to speak about solidarity, like here, yeah. It's very, very difficult, very, very difficult to give it a new sense or reframe it or redefine it in the in a contemporary way. I find it very important that you brought it out. Yeah. Yeah. A problem with the word solidarity in Spanish is that in Mexican Spanish at least is also that it was the the big uh, campaign, not the campaign, the the the, the, the the sort of the presidential slogan for Carlos Salinas de Gortari. So it was the, the problem with solidaridad. So the, really the word became stained in, um, in, 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 in Mexican um, just cultural jargon. Solidaridad still, still smells like shit, yeah. Which should, it should. In India, uh, in our Indian languages, we don't have a word for solidarity. The word typically is oneness, you know, which is unity, which is something else. I mean, mm. unity is not solidarity. Because it's spiritual it's, sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think, um, well, the idea of solidarity in terms of writing and in terms of expression I, is difficult. I mean, we've been talking about collaboration in terms of, of your particular, what particular form of art you are, are producing. Um, but true solidarity amongst artists and writers should not be confined to political opinion. It seems to me that we are facing censorship from two angles, from a so-called progressive side which is to do with self-censorship, and a very nasty authoritarian strain which is appearing everywhere in the world. And we have to always fight for the freedom of expression and always fight, even if we disagree and find repellent what uh, the other person is writing, or there's no guarantee whether it's good or bad art or good or bad writing what the political opinion is. But to fight for the freedom, the right to uh, freedom of expression is extremely important. And I, I, feel, that, uh, I, I feel that the so-called progressive side is absolutely as bad as the regressive side in this. And voices are disappearing the whole time. So, and, uh, you know, in the, uh, uh, as we, there's Valeria sitting next to Ashley, we, you know, one person taught the other. It's really important that there are people who are there teaching and uh, following generations about this, and about this idea that you must, if you are going to live in a society which values truth, which values um, uh, responsibility as well as representation, that you have to listen to other people and you have to... Uh, defend their right to the death to say something that you absolutely abhor. That's the that's the real that's where the solidarity should be amongst artists. And, I mean, and that that 
And that's why I always go back to this, this idea of, of, um, of in certain forms of collaboration, not, um, not really having a, a, a pre-fixed agenda and plan. Um, I mean, I, I, when I was working with, with the factory workers, I guess the, 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 what I wanted um, from, from, from that collaboration was, was simply to explore what they thought uh, of the fact that they produced juice that ultimately funded art and what they, what they felt about that. And the only way to, to, to get them to speak about that was by not really saying, this is my project, this is my plan, here, listen to me as an author speaking to you and telling you. It, was, it, was, it had to be more, I guess, more like a slower kind of thing, right? You a, gave a, them a platform. I gave you them the platform. Grow, I let them, I don't, I, don't let, I, don't think, I don't know if I let them grow, but I, but I, by, but I, I let them react and, and, and then, and then I reacted to them, and, and, and that, that's, a, it's a, that's a conversation, right? And I don't know, I have no idea what, what, what drove them to be involved in this, because, yeah, I mean, they, 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 they would be reading uh, on, like, after a long day's work, they would stay after and get together and still read. Um, the, only, the only thing they got from it was, like, cookies around the table. I mean, it's not like they were, so I don't know what their motivation, what their motivation was. I wish, I wish I did know. It's funny that you mentioned the, the progressive censorship because just last week, <coughs> a very important Mexican poet <coughs> was telling me about his new book and he was writing a passage and he was imagining a, like another writer going after him on Twitter because of that passage. So he was saying, should I write this or not? And he had already imagined what he was going to reply on Twitter, should this other guy? So uh, I think it's, uh, it, it quite shocked me to, to see that this is going on because it's like writers uh, cannibalizing um, each other. We have like one minute for questions, so uh, <laughs> if there anybody would like to ask something to our panel members. Oh, please. You know, uh, uh, the, the Hindu right wing uh, in India has been on the move um, since the mid-1980s. Um, and in the 90s, they came to political power, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, now they, have, they really have a, a grip on the country. And uh, the color of the Hindu right wing is saffron, because saffron in their sort of neo-Hinduism uh, Neo seems to be my favorite word today. Uh, but it, is, it, it goes to the point that I want to make, actually. Um, uh, so, you know, it's a sacred color of Hinduism. So in the 80s uh, and in the 90s especially, you know, a lot of us, uh, um, we stopped wearing saffron. We sort of didn't go anywhere any other color. Uh, for my work, I work with a Hindu text. Uh, you know, through the 90s, and so in public, I would be really ashamed to say that I worked with this text, and so, you know, many of us did all these things. Um, and now, you know, in this conversation about solidarity and Anna's point about how it's a very difficult word to use, and Valeria's point that it smells of shit, you know what? We've got to take these words back. Yeah. We've got to take these colors back. Like, who are you to tell me what color I should wear and what color I should wear? How, how, um, how, I mean, now, you know, I mean, 20 years ago, I was fully into, oh, I'm not going to wear saffron, I'm not going to do this. And 20 years later, I think I was younger and um, more stupid than uh, I think I'm wiser now. And instead of giving things up to the powers that we disagree with, we have to take them back. Yeah. You know, we have to assert our ownership of them and, you know, transform them into, into, um, into positive energies rather than into like, oh, I can't say this and I can't wear that and, you yeah. know. It's like people saying they're going to leave the U.S. when Trump gets president. No, it's the moment, to, like I live there now, it's like the moment to stay. It's the moment to stay and resist and make sure that he, uh, he doesn't usurp the language and, and everything else. Anybody has any questions? We promise not to answer. <laughs> I just wanted to find out to what extent do any of the panels set objective criteria before you set off on your social art projects so you know your project has been successful at the end? 
Um, how do you measure yourself in your achievement? Um, evaluating this sort of thing is very difficult. Um, w w this is why we involved uh, a psych psychiatrist. Um, all you can really, you know, it had, we started off with a humanitarian purpose, which uh, was revealed to us in terms of therapy, in terms of making people feel, uh, gain extra stills, feel better about themselves, have two weeks paid work, or whatever it was. Um, uh, and uh, it was borne out that it did help people with depression and PTSD, and all we could ever do is really go around the women and say, how did, you, how did you feel now, and how did you feel then? Uh, and we got a positive response. That was it. But objectively, the idea was that uh, they should that, that this project should help them in terms of dealing with uh, PTSD and depression, and we could only evaluate that as best we can. And it's very important that we actually now uh, encourage other people in this particular field to say, you know, this is worth doing for these particular purposes, if you're going to be so bloodless, as it were, at a similar conference on uh, women mental health, uh, women's mental health in the Arab world in Amman, our psychiatrist stood up and, and, and I spoke more psychobabble than he did. He stood up and said that we are all human beings and we must treat each other as, each other as human beings and the, the, this sort of collaboration helps people who feel they may have become something less uh, or, or being born something less to... Um, I don't know, feel equal. Anyway, he, he thought it was a good thing, and that was good enough for me. <laughs> and the women thought it was a good thing, and that was good enough for me. You, you, you successful as a piece of art, it's, you never know, eh? I mean, it's, it's a question of taste as well. But in my last project, I was always very interested on this subject. Like, this is my, yeah, this is what I think, it's good. Art is good for people, huh? They're getting better, they're getting more open, blah, blah, blah. So for now, before I started to work with these ch children, I asked a psychologist to come and really make a, a felmirish, yeah, like they like really as they do special questions and the, and there are numbers at the end of the questions and they and she did, and at the middle of the project I asked her to come and just look around, just oh. keep contact with the people. She made interviews and everything, and when we finished the whole project, she made again the completely same research. So now I have a paper of it with numbers that is good, <laughs> <laughs> really. <laughs> I can't measure it. Thank you. <laughs> Can, can't measure it in the number of visitors or the in the exhibition, right? You could measure it in the number of visitors, or you could measure it in the. But I measured it actually in the guided tours faces. So when I made the curatorial tour for people who came. They were led through, and I saw their faces from the entrance to the exit, how the face changed. Mm -hmm. This was more than everything, more than everything. Empathy, empathy became into the room, present. And it was a, it was a great deal, it was a great deal. Plus, the media picked up this topic because nobody really spoke about dumpster diving and food waste and all these things. And after that, Hungarian media and everything was full with food waste and, and, and how we have to deal with that and, and upcycling and recycling and all that stuff. And this is for me a very, very good sign that I can raise awareness towards topics and questions. This is my kind of success with Kultur Gorilla. Well, since we are running late, I think it's time to call up. Thank you so much for everybody for being on the panel, and thank you so much for, for attending.